Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on the part of the world that you're joining us from. I'd like, I'd like to welcome you to the very first in the series of webinars on data quality hosted by the National Data Quality Forum. My name is Nidhi Kurana. I am a knowledge translation specialist at the Population Council's India Country Office, and I will be moderating this session. To provide a frame for this event, the overarching goal of our webinar series is to foster a community of practice by creating a meaningful dialogue on data quality between the producers and consumers of health and demographic data. We have zeroed in on three thematic areas, nutrition, immunization, and family planning. So please look out for more webinar invites in your inboxes over the next three months, and we shall look forward to meeting you about twice a month. Moving on to today's session, data quality in developing country settings is a function of many factors, including resources, periodicity, survey design, and data collection protocols. This has important implications for how well or poorly the policies are informed by hard evidence on the ground. Built-in data quality checks, feedback loops, and machine learning can help enhance data quality and better inform policy design. To help us navigate some of these challenges, we have Christy Laziki and Nancy Jain from ID Insight who will discuss systems and innovations to help improve data quality in surveys. Christy is an economist with ID Insight's Nairobi office, and Mansi is an associate based in New Delhi. Uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping items before we begin. All attendees will be on mute until after the presentation. We'll then take questions in batches of three to four, either through participants raising their hands virtually. You'll see an icon next to your name, and then we'll unmute you and you can use your mics to ask, or you can also type in your questions in the chat box. We request that you please make your questions brief and pointed. Uh, this will allow us to get through as many of these as we can. With that, I'll turn it over to Christy. Great, thanks Nidhi for the introduction. I just wanna also just give a, a quick shout out to another member of our team who I believe on, is on the call, Krishanu Chakraborty, who is the Data On Demand lead at ID Insight, of which we'll be chatting to you about today. So yeah, as Nidhi mentioned, we're gonna be talking through some uh, systems and algorithms that we're using at ID Insight to enhance data quality. And we're specifically gonna be talking about how we do this at, within large scale data collection, uh, because that invites in a different set of challenges. So today we're going to discuss with you a few things. So I'll just give a very quick overview into ID Insight to give you a flavor of what we do. And then we'll also touch on briefly the data on demand uh, model, which is the infrastructure that we developed to collect this large scale data. Uh, but we'll spend the brief, rather we'll spend the bulk of the discussion talking about the data quality assurance mechanisms that we have embedded within DOD to secure data quality. And we'll also chat to you about the machine learning work that we're doing. So at ID Insight, our mission is to help leaders in the social sector use data and evidence to combat poverty worldwide. We deploy a broad and rigorous range of services, including impact evaluations, monitoring, data analytics, and machine learning. And we really focus on helping our clients answer their most pressing impact questions facing the, within the context and constraints that they face. We've worked in over 25 countries, but in particular, we have quite deep presence in India, where we've worked in over 15 states over the last eight years. Let me talk next about the data on demand model that we've developed at ID Insight. First, let me take a step back to motivate why did ID Insight created this data on demand model? So as I'm sure we all would agree, good quality data is critical for, for informing quality policy, good policy. However, in many instances, policymakers are currently lacking access to timely and accurate data needed to inform policy design and implementation. A few of the key challenges are that it can be very expensive, so several millions of dollars to conduct a census, is conducted quite infrequently on the order of several years. It can be of poor quality. 
and the methodology and sampling frames can often be inaccessible. On this graph, we're illustrating a trade-off that typically plagues data collection. So as you increase the speed in which data is collected, you usually end up trading off quality of data. And so a quick example here is MIS, which is in the lower right quadrant of this graph. That shows, um, and you can see here that MIS is always worse than a good quality survey, but governments are typically relying on this to inform decisions just because surveys can take too long. So what DOD is really trying to do is to create new options that combine both high speed data collection and quali high quality to, um, at, at a speed that meets administrative and policymakers needs. So just to give you a quick context of, of, of how quickly and uh, cheaply we're trying to do this. And I, um, we once collected a panel survey of about 27,000 households in just 60 days. So there are three pillars of the data on demand model that allow us to do this. The first is the collection infrastructure. So we've developed a distributive network of local surveyors that we can tap into to survey on a short notice. And we've also constructed a representative panel of households that can be surveyed periodically. We rely on flexible data systems. So specifically, we've developed survey modules and coding scripts that are ready to adapt and also have flexible data pipelines that enable real-time reports and visualizations. And then finally, we have a, a strong focus on quality through a technology-based system that includes automated flagging and follow-ups, as well as audits across a host of different indicators. And so this is actually what we wanted to speak most to you about today, is what are the systems that we have created to really ensure data quality? So I'm gonna turn it now over to Mansi, who's gonna walk you through those systems. Great, hey, thanks, Christy. Um, hi, everyone. So before I begin describing the systems that we use to ensure high quality data, I just wanna zoom out a little bit to talk about why we think building these systems is important. Um, Christy, could you move to the next slide, please? Okay, so as all of us probably know, there are lots of issues that can arise on the field when you're collecting data. So for example, there might be misunderstandings between the surveyor and the respondent. It could be that the surveyor is actively falsifying data. It could also just be that the surveyor has heard the data correct, but has entered it wrong. Irrespective, all of these things can mean bad data for you, which in turn can lead to bad policy recommendations. And so clearly managing your data quality is really important. Next slide, please. However, doing this at scale is actually really hard. Because unlike in a traditional survey, when you're actually with the surveyors and training them and monitoring them to see what's going wrong, all of this is now happening in a decentralized way. Under the data on demand model, it can sometimes be the case that we have hundreds of surveyors doing surveys in thousands of households at the same time all over the country. And surveying conditions are very variable, which means that monitoring all of this stuff manually becomes close to impossible. All of this in totality means that we need really robust systems to make sure that we can still maintain high quality. Next slide, please. Okay, so what systems have we actually implemented under DOD? So as you'll notice on this screen, um, we really believe that data quality is a continual process. It's something that we implement systems for before the survey, during, as well as after, and not just something we do during the survey. These systems are also systems that we've tested through many different surveys we've done across all types of content areas. For example, education, a lot of health surveys, even financial inclusion surveys. So I'm now gonna begin talking about each of these in detail, beginning with the first one, which is our pre-survey checks. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we do before the survey to prevent errors as early on as possible? So this essentially consists of three different pillars. The first one is incentives for surveyors. So when we hire surveyors, we really make sure to emphasize that their incentives are gonna be based not just on their productivity, but also on their data quality. And I'll get to how we actually measure this data quality later in the, in the talk. 
The second pillar is survey or training. We really want to make sure that uh, training is happening in a very standardized way across, across all the places we're doing surveys. And we also want to make sure that surveyors understand each and every question in great detail. So we invest a lot in making standardized training videos, as well as making sure that surveyors do quizzes after, so that we can actually test how well they understood the content. And if needed, we retrain them during the survey, during the training period itself. And then finally, the third pillar is a rigorous form design, which basically means two things. The first one is that we want to embed as many hints and notes as possible for the surveyors in the form itself to make sure that they don't later forget what they're supposed to ask. And the second thing is that we want to restrict non-sensible values as much as possible early on. So for example, it doesn't really make sense that a pregnant woman is 80 years old. And so we're just not going to allow that type of data to enter our system. Um, great, so next slide, please. So that's what we do before the survey. Now, what do we actually do during the survey to measure our data quality? This consists of three things primarily. So the first one is high frequency checks or data checks. Um, next slide, please. So what this essentially means is that at the end of the day, when we've actually got our submissions, we run these, we run these submissions through our automated systems to flag certain types of errors that may arise. So for example, are there submissions that we think have are just happened in too short a time duration that and good quality data just could not have been collected that fast? Or is it the case that certain values just don't seem logical? For example, a pregnant woman might indicate that she got antenatal care while also saying that she never registered her pregnancy. And so we really want to flag these types of errors early on so we can convey these to surveyors and make sure that errors are not repeated. Um, next slide, please. The second type of check we do during the survey is spot checks. Um, a lot of you might already be familiar with this. It is something that many traditional surveys do. Um, basically what it means is that occasionally we send monitors to accompany surveyors to the house to see how well they're asking questions. And then after that, we make them fill out a form to detail any protocol violations that the surveyor could have made. Now, obviously this kind of thing suffers from one obvious downside potentially which is that surveyors may actually put in more effort uh, when they're being monitored. And so they might perform well right now, but it's not representative of their actual performance. And so the way we try to minimize this risk is by making sure we're flagging violations at a very granular question level, which would be much more a function of the surveyor's knowledge levels of how to do a survey rather than his effort. And so not something that he can fudge in the moment. Next slide, please. And then finally, the third thing we do is back checks. So this can look like many different things. Um, often we do in-person back checks, which basically means that we'll send certain monitors to go to a few households that are randomly selected. Um, and we ask them to do certain questions or sections again, just to make sure that the values are lining up. Now, obviously this is a very expensive process potentially. And so we also use phone back checks very intensively. And then finally, we often record um, recordings of the survey itself while it's happening and go through them to make sure that there's no mismatch in values. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So all of those three things combined are basically how we measure data quality while the survey is happening. And so the next question that arises is, how do we actually communicate this to the surveyors in an actionable way? Next slide, please. So we have three, two or three different ways of doing this. The first and pr first primary thing is actually making a dashboard that details all these errors. Um, and we aggregate all these errors from all these different checking systems in meaningful ways, say at the surveyor level, or say at the district level, at the state level, how many errors are happening, um, how does this differ by days, things like that. And then we pass this on to surveyors so that they can see where they're making errors and act on those fast. Often through this dashboard process, we find that certain surveyors are making certain specific mistakes. And so we often organize one-on-one -on -one calls with them to figure out where the misunderstanding is and actually help them get over that misunderstanding. Often though, we also find that there are misunderstandings across the entire group or just that people could learn, stand to learn from each other. And so we'll often do debriefs of a lot of surveyors uh, in collection so that they can together go through a dashboard and see where there's scope for improvement. And accordingly, if there's need, we often do retraining based on sections that need help. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what we do during the survey. And hopefully through all of these systems, we think we prevent errors and flag them pretty early on, which is great. But sometimes it does happen that we reach the end, we realize that there are certain values that aren't correct. And so we have to go into data corrections. So how do we actually go about this process? Next slide, please. Okay, so there are, uh, there are three or four different steps to actually doing data correction. The first one is trying to figure out, are these variables that we want to correct even important? Um, because if not, it may not be worth the resources to actually go through this process. Next, we'll often contact surveyors to try to figure out what went wrong and see if we can spot the error here itself. After that, um, we'll often dig into certain things that we got out of the survey when it was happening itself. So for example, the audio files that I was mentioning or photos that we may have clipped to see if we can determine the correct data point here itself. And then finally, if none of this stuff works, we will sometimes go back to households, either over the phone or in person to actually collect the data again. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's all for the data systems that we usually use in an infield survey. And so one question that I'm sure a lot of you might be thinking and that I wanna address right now is like, okay, this is great, but I'm gonna be doing phone surveys for the next few months. And so is any of this still relevant? Um, and our answer to that is that it definitely is. And we've used these systems many times for phone surveys already and found them to be extremely useful and still just as applicable with a few small modifications. So for example, when we're trying to measure data quality during the survey itself, we might no longer do any in-person back checks because there was no in-person data collection to begin with. Similarly, it doesn't make sense to do spot checks anymore. And so we'll mostly just rely on audio audits and sometimes phone back checks. Similarly, um, in terms of our, how we communicate this information back to surveyors, for the most part, we still maintain the same protocols. We have a dashboard, we have debriefs, all of that. But for the dashboard, in addition to what we usually track, we also track certain indicators of quality that are specific to phone surveys, such as whether the surveyor called back at the time that they were supposed to call back and things like that, or like how, how long was the duration of the phone call. Um, yeah, so hopefully, all of you find these systems useful. Um, I'm now going to pass it back to Christy to talk about some of our innovations work. Thank you. Okay, moving on to discuss how we've been using machine learning to enhance data quality. So Mansi's just talked to you about a host of different systems that we've embedded within the DoD. Um, model to ensure data quality. However, there's still some limitations of these systems at scale. So for example, there is a coverage cost trade-off. It would be really expensive to back check every single survey or spot check every single survey. So the implication is that coverage can sometimes be low. And then a second challenge is given the magnitude of data that's coming in at such large scale, it can be difficult to sift through and catch all issues in time to act on them. So we believe that machine learning is well suited for this challenge. And we're currently building an algorithm that can automatically detect data quality issues as surveys are submitted. Our Envision pipeline here is that enumerators would complete a survey and then all of those surveys would be uploaded and run through an algorithm that flags questions for which it was likely that the enumerator did not ask the question well. And then that information is fed back to our teams that can use that to prioritize data quality interventions accordingly, such as which enumerators might need a little bit more spot checking, which teams might need additional retraining. And then this allows that data quality problems are addressed before the issue is repeated. So we're in the process of developing that model using real world data quality outcomes. So our data comes from a large scale survey that was conducted for NITI, the ID Insight conducted for NITI IOG's aspirational district program that includes data across several different domains, including education, health, agriculture, and finance. And during that survey, many survey sections were randomly and silently recorded. And then those audio segments were fed back to a team of auditors 
that listened to each segment and rated the enumerator on each question on a series of survey protocol points. And then those gradings will could be combined with metadata about the survey and the question, for example, what time of day the survey was conducted, the duration of the question, question order and type, et cetera, to create our data set that we'll fill this model from. So on this next slide, I have a, a rough schematic of what this looks like. So overall, our data set comes from over 10,000 surveys across multiple districts, states, survey topics, and surveyors and overall equates to over 310,000 questions. And so as you can see in this figure here, we are going to be aggregating survey metadata. So we're really focusing on, on features about the survey that would be generalizable to any type of survey so that we can use this tool across contexts. And we'll use that metadata to predict surveyor performance. So again, the likelihood that they conducted the question well. So this is our, we're still uh, refining this data set and continuing to think about how we can improve and how we can collect more data to enhance the model. And that wraps up what we wanted to share with you today. I hope you found that session useful and happy to answer any questions you have for us. And then at this point, I'll turn it over. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Uh, thank you, Christy and Mansi, for the excellent, engaging presentation. Uh, before uh, before taking questions from the floor, uh, I have one of my own. And the intent of this question is to tease out sort of best practice or learning in how improved data quality can really drive policy change. So what I'd like to do, like for you to do for us would be to refer to your entire three-year experience with the data on demand model, uh, boil the proverbial ocean as it were, and crystallize with an example the entire process of learning from problem definition to intervention through to data quality improvement, and finally policy design impact. Any of you can take a take a swing at it, please. Yeah, thanks, Nidhi. I can take that question. Um, so there are two things that are coming to mind for me. The first one is that there have been cases where our data systems have allowed us to spot and correct certain issues that would have resulted in flawed policy recommendations. So for example, um, in this one health survey we did, we asked our surveyors to look at respondents' MCP cards and note down mm -hmm. both the number of times they had tested their hemoglobin levels as well as the latest value for hemoglobin. And it turned out that a lot of surveyors actually got confused and mixed up the two and entered data in the wrong fields, um, which would have produced very distorted estimates for hemoglobin level in some of the districts and thus resulted in us recommending an allocation of resources that may not be appropriate. And one of our data check systems, which was the, the high frequency checks that I was talking about, actually allowed us to catch this because we could see that the values that we were seeing from submissions were slightly lower than what we had expected for hemoglobin levels. Um, and then more broadly, I think that uh, showing partners our data quality protocol has helped us win their trust and so increase the likelihood that they might actually act on our recommendations. And so in that sense, it's been relevant for actually getting policy action going. And mm -hmm. I also think that using our data um, we've been able to show sometimes how biased secondary sources and things like MIS data can actually be. And that in turn has prevented them from making decisions based on fraud data and also increase the value that they attribute to primary data. Right. Now that's, that's very insightful. That's, that really brings it home for us as to how, you know, how data quality, quality checks can really, really improve the quality of data and then how that helps inform policy. Um, so I think the first question is uh, on the phone or on the audio from Prithvish Srikantaya. Uh, Radhika, if you can unmute him, uh, he can please, uh, can please speak. Hi, I have unmuted Prithvish. Um, still showing on mute. Okay, um, never mind. We can take the question from Darshana then. 
Uh, hi, uh, Christy. Hi, Mansi. This is surely a wonderful session. Uh, I wanted to check regarding the audio audit facility that uh, you know you mentioned. Um, in terms of you know the ethical uh, you know uh, conflicts that might arise when you're recording without informing the respondent about the survey being recorded. Um, how do you address this when you are using audio audit? And and uh, Nithu, just to double check, are you taking a few questions or yeah, shall we? Taking a few, yeah, we are taking a couple of questions. So I think the next one probably uh, from S. Siva Prasad. Please go ahead, Siva. Okay, Rana, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the session. So I was curious. Um, since you do rapid surveys, uh, you know, it's a shorter timeline. Uh, and in this case, do you still translate these surveys? Uh, and do surveyors usually, uh, I mean, is it conducted in local languages um, um, uh, uh, across different parts of the country? And like, what kinds of uh, issues does that pose for uh, data uh, quality checks? Okay, one more, and then uh, we can, uh, we can take three together. So Dharma is next, I think. Dharma, uh, Anushri, I think Anushri is unmuted. Can Anushri please yeah. take a question? Uh, hello, thank please. you for that talk. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, when uh, when you get when there are inconsistencies in data, and if you're using a phone call method uh, to cross check uh, those inconsistencies, uh, since there is a kind of uh, re uh, already recall bias, how would you cater to that issue, those issues? Okay, so thank you, Anushree, uh, and uh, thank you, Rona, and. Thank you, Darshana, for your questions. Uh, so if uh, you guys can just address these for now, and then we can move on to the next set. We'll take mm -hmm. some on the chat box as well after this. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thanks for these very thoughtful questions. Mansi, I can take the first and the third. Are you happy to take the second? Yep, that sounds good. OK, great. Uh, so the first question on uh, this consent issue for audio audits, yes, that's a, a really great um, question. And so the way that we typically address this is that in the consent form, so before we begin any survey, of course, there's an informed consent process that goes through the, the goals of the research and the expected benefits and risk. Um, and part of that consent includes um, there, there may be part of this um, survey may be audio recorded for data quality purposes, um, and, and, and as part of that consent process, they have the option to opt out of the survey if they don't feel comfortable with that. Um, so that's how we address that issue, um, but definitely something that you want to make sure that people are aware of that there's this possibility they might be recorded. Um, and then surveyors are, are also informed that this is going on in our training as part of our overall data quality mechanism. So, so they have, um, they're aware of that as well. On the third question and third question on inconsistencies with um, the phone calls, another great, great point as well. Um, and so this is on our minds when we design the back check. So it's very important when we think of which questions to back check. We want to think of we want to choose questions that are less vulnerable to that phone call bias. So questions that we don't expect to change over a matter of days and things that are salient enough that um, people would still know that for example you know do you own a tv um or did someone come to visit your your household a couple days ago and ask you some questions about health um things like that that we think would be less susceptible to that uh, and then it's also important to have those back checks you know within a matter of days to to minimize the transfer um, recall issues creeping in uh, hey, then, i can take the second question um, so yeah, that's a really great point on translation. I think we really believe that translation is important um, in any survey we do, because otherwise a lot of misunderstandings can creep in 
and spoil the data. And so we definitely also make an effort to translate into local languages. Um, and in order to do that, we also try to have surveyors hired from that specific region as well. So as much as possible, we try to hire surveyors from the same district itself to make sure that they speak the same dialect of the same language as well, as much as possible. Um, and we also make sure that even for the surveyors, we do, we do translate all our materials. Like our dashboard should also have um, explanations in their local language. All our feedback to them should also be translated into their language, things like that. Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Nancy and Christy, uh, for those answers. And uh, we'll take a few in the chat box now. Uh, so since Prithvish, uh, for some reason, we could not unmute you, or there's some glitch with that, I'll ask you yours first. So Prithvish Srikanteya asks, what percentage of data sets do you suggest uh, for field service, telephone service, etc.? cetera? Uh, what percentage of data sets do you suggest yeah. Sorry, what type, what what is the word before data sets? She said what percentage of oh, data percent sets would you suggest for quality checks? He means for quality checks. What percentage of data sets for phone surveys and field surveys for quality checks? So what percent are you checking? Got That's it. his question. Okay. And then uh I think uh there were a couple of folks, Nita Goyal and uh, uh, also Subrato, uh, he's asked the same question. They've asked, uh, do these checks add uh, to the cost significantly, the additional checks that you're incorporating? And then we'll take one more. Um, and this is, I'll try to take the ones. This is from Ashita. Uh, does the quality check system require verbatim translation for different languages in which the data is collected? So these are the three questions that you can quickly answer those as well. Does quality checks so allow for different languages? I didn't hear that one. So does the quality check system require verbatim translation, verbatim translation for different languages in which the data is collected? So are you translating word by word? Uh, do your quality checks allow for that? Uh, if there are different languages or dialects, you know, do you, does your system allow for that? Great. Okay. Okay. Nancy, do you want to start and I can add to you given your, your DOD experience? Um, yeah, sure. So on the first question, which is like how, what percentage of data do we actually conduct checks on? Um, so it really depends. I think one of the so like I mentioned one of the systems to be high frequency checks, which is basically just passing all your data through a certain set of automated checks. And so that we can do for all our data always. And so a lot of issues often come up through that, um, which is great. But then obviously, like you mentioned, or like you probably meant, there are systems that we do have to allocate and that are resource intensive. So obviously we can't do spot checks for all the submissions, we can't do back checks for all the submissions. Um, and so it really depends. It depends on the timeline. It depends on the budget we have. It depends also on the priorities for the client. So, for example, we might be doing a survey on many different topics, but the client may prioritize health over some other section. And so we might allocate more of our resources to back checking those sections. Um, I think typically we try to back check at least 10 to 20% of our data, although we're trying to move more and more towards lower cost systems of, of checking our data. So for example, focusing more on audio audits. And so in that case, I think we will be able to ramp up the percentage that we check significantly. Um, on the second point, which is the cost, yes, these systems are definitely not cheap to execute, but we definitely think it's worth it um, to, to get good quality data. Some of these, like I mentioned, don't really rely on cost. So like the high frequency checks, there's no cost to them. It's just a bunch of code running. But then, yeah, sending auditors to houses is costly. Um, yeah, and then I can't really remember the third question. I think it was about uh, language. Yeah, yeah, it was about, you know, whether your system allows uh, verbatim translation uh, from, uh, you know, uh, for quality checks. Does your quality check system allow verbatim translation word for word from the from in different languages. So how 
flexible is it with different languages, particularly when we look at the Indian context, I think that's what they're trying to get at. Um, yeah, I mean, I think most of our responses often just look like numbers. And so there's mm -hmm. not a need to translate a lot of the data that we have. Obviously, mm -hmm. there are things that for which we need text submissions. And so mm -hmm. for those things, I'm not actually 100% sure whether for, I, I doubt that we can automatically translate every single submission, but I think we mm -hmm. can at least tell whether the submission, whether the response is matching up between our submission and our audio audit or something like that. Like we can match the strings and figure that out. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if yeah, yeah, yeah no, that. no, that that's helpful. Uh, but uh, on the so on the cost uh, bit, I also sort of like wanted to probe a little bit more. Uh, so you said they that you know it does these are definitely not cheap. So in terms of like say a survey cost for interview indicator, do you know that how much does this add? Like you know, in terms of a person add on, would you have some ballpark around that? Um, so I don't, but I think Krishanu, who is in the audience, who Christy introduced earlier, might have some more insight on that. So okay, I'd like to have unmute that. Krishanu. Go and unmute Krishanu, please. Yeah, hi, Krishanu. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. yeah, we can hear you, Krishanu, yes. Yeah, you, yeah, which part of the question should I answer? Mansi, can you repeat that? Um, so, Krishanu, I think Nidhi was about, oh, sorry, Nidhi, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, <laughs> you know, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Um, I think Nidhi was asking about the costs of our different uh, data quality systems. How much does it actually add on to have all of these systems in place to the budget? Uh, okay, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think that uh, we ever budgeted by uh, the data quality systems as a proportion of the total budget for service. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the way to think of this is, uh, you know, like one is a very direct cost on the percentage of uh, you know, service to be back checked, for example. And uh, these are, I would say, uh, baked into the number of days that a particular surveyor or anyone in the field is actually spending on doing uh, a, either the uh, spot checks or the team who is uh, sitting and doing the audio back checks, or, for example. So those uh, percentages are, are already so those uh, costs are already baked in, but roughly to just, uh, you know, like, hmm, I can theorize a bit right now uh, at mm -hmm. this point. I think the way to think of this is that there would be like at least, you know, like for the example, two monitors or three monitors for every, you know, like 10 or 15 odd surveyors uh, on how complicated that survey is in every district. So then you can, you know, think of like what's the percentage cost is. So I think the other better framing of this is uh, is a is a way to think of this is that, that the data quality is an investment into how good you need your data to be. So depending on a the complexity of the survey, and b you know for for surveys which are really long, for example in person, then you would need like more and more uh, percentage of your total survey cost to actually go to data quality, uh, just to be sure. So I think that would be the way I would push towards it. But I think this is also a very good question. I think uh, we may, you know, like probably at a later stage, come up with some answers about what percentage of at least our survey costs are geared towards only our data quality measures. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean that that we can actually write a blog post about it and then share with everyone. Lovely. That's that's excellent. So there's a queue for a for a blog post. Um, so now uh, moving back to the audio queue. I think uh, we have Trisha. Trisha, uh, Radhika, if you can unmute her, so Trisha can please ask her question. Uh, hi. I just have one question. One of your slides mentioned that ML flags questions with likely data quality problems. Just wanted to know if there is a way we can identify and treat data quality issues due to the falsification of responses. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. That was about the, not the machine learning slide, the systems, right? That was in relation to? If there is a way that you can treat it through machine learning, if not, then how do you address such a problem? Was there another question? Sorry, are we taking... Sorry, no. Yeah, we're taking another one, sorry. We, no? Akash, can you, yeah, KD Maiti. Okay, Meiti, please ask your question, please. 
uh, yeah i have one question that uh, you were talking about back checks in the service but then how these back checks can be catered while we have perception based questions or questions which have uh, social desirability involved like uh, questions about food security how back check can be helpful while we are dealing with perception based questions and not factual questions mhm mm yeah great okay um, Manzi, I can take these and you want to jump in uh, or add to anything I say? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So on the first question, how do you design a system that flags falsification? I think this is the perennial question that we're <laughs> always thinking about. Um, so the system that um, Manzi was talking about to try to, to flag things where we think there's something fishy going on that might point to some sort of falsification or maybe, you know, in a, in a um, more benign way, just misunderstanding, uh, what we call these high frequency checks. So we co we run a survey through these checks every day and it spits out anything that seems fishy. Now, how do we decide what seems fishy? Unfortunately, there is no way to automate that process. We need to go through this survey and think about what do we think are possible logical inconsistencies that might pop out here. So Mansi gave the example of, you know, a pregnant woman being um, over 80 years old. Um, there are some ways to program that into this survey to, to prevent such values that are outside of range from being inputted. But sometimes we can't actually program all those checks in the survey itself because sometimes there's a little bit more complicated. Um, so we will, uh, in our Stata code, program checks against different variables that we think would be inconsistent. Um, so for example, looking at consumption values that are um, seem to be really high, they don't they aren't necessarily wrong, but they seem unlikely and we want to dig into that a little bit more. So we flag things that seem weird and then we go back to the raw data um, and investigate whether the other questions are in line with that. We may do follow-ups with the respondents, follow up with the surveyors, as uh, Nancy had suggested. So unfortunately, that one's a little bit more of an, an art than a science. It really takes an understanding of your survey to, to know what might, and, and the context as well, to think about what would be an inconsistency. Um, and then for the machine learning piece as well, this is also a, a big question that we're grappling with. How do we, is it possible to do this? In order to do this, you need some sort of ground truth data of, of cases where surveys are actually falsified. Um, and so in our data, we, we don't know for sure. We just know based on what the auditors heard, whether a surveyor conducted that well or not. And we have data on whether the response that they inputted was matched or not, but it might not have been to deliberate falsification. It might've been a mistake. Um, so we are currently training the model based on kind of surveyor performance as based on the actual reporting and not what um, not, we're not able to get at ground truth falsification, unfortunately, but we do think that what we're, the outcomes that we're using are still strong predictors of data quality. Perfect. Thank you, Christy. Uh, so there's been a lot of interest and I know that there are many, many more questions, but uh, we can only probably squeeze in a couple more. Uh, so I'm going to ask one that came over email from one of our government stakeholders, Dr. Sahu from uh, the National Institute of Medical Statistics has asked, how does using computer assisted personal interviewing, the CAPI technique in large scale health surveys improve data quality versus paper based interviewing? I don't know if you can speak to that. I, I know that it's not, uh, you know, in your presentation, but if you can speak to that, that would be truly helpful. And then I will unmute uh, Nandita here, and she can go ahead and ask the question, please. So those would be the last two questions, and then we need to close. So let's start. Yeah, Nandita, please go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. This talk is very interesting. Uh, so most of your strategies are to address the data quality issue from interviewer perspective, but a lot of time, data quality is poor because of the respondents. Uh, even the simplest example is age or age of debt. Okay, thank you, Nandita. So, Christy Mansi, do you want to take that? 
And then also the other question around computer assisted personal interviewing technique, if you are clued into that. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I can't talk directly from experience on computer assisted interviewing versus in person um, surveys. With health. We tend to um, have, I haven't done the computer assisted for health, but we tend to do a lot of in person surveys for for health. Uh, and I guess it depends ultimately making the distinction between these two mediums. Um, there's a couple of different things to trade off. So the first thing to think about is what data you actually want to collect um, and whether that's something that you think you is better collected in person, such as you know maybe observation of certain health outcomes um, or things that might need a little bit extra probing and explanation by the enumerator. It's very valuable to have um, that person in person for that versus things that might just be um, very kind of quick initial um, data points on on um, you know maybe like perception based health questions that might be easier to collect on the phone something that um, you know maybe a ten minute questionnaire so that's kind of one thing to think about another thing to think about is obviously cost phone surveys um, and logistics phone surveys are a lot cheaper um, and a lot faster. But uh, it may also allow you to reach a larger scope uh, in a shorter amount of time, uh, while in person obviously um, is involved more door-to-door um, -door at work. And then another thing to think about, and in this respect to health, and, and is also the the non-response that you might get with phone versus in person, and whether there um, are particular types of populations for which non-response might be more prevalent and whether that might have any correlation with your health outcomes in, uh, in particular that might change how you would interpret the information. Um, so those are kind of some just high level things to think about. Um, and then on the second question on uh, the systems being mostly focused on a new rate, I think yes and no. I think definitely um, all our systems are looking at kind of the interaction between a numerator and respondent. Um, so, for example, spot checks. You know, we show up in person and we're there in the interview, so we can catch misunderstandings on both sides. Uh, on the back checks, you know, we only see what was entered at the end of the day, but that is a function of what happened between the numerator and respondent. And so any issues there, we would follow up with both the numerator and respondent to try to dig into the um, what led to that misunderstanding. So I think I think we do try to think about both sides because definitely agree. Um, data quality issues can creep in from, from all different ways. Great. Thanks so much, Christy. Uh, that's, that's a great perspective. Uh, we do need to close now. Uh, we could we could go on for a lot more longer. I understand that. And uh, I thank you again now for your interest and thank our presenters for the day, uh, Christy and Marcy and also Krishanu for your inputs. Uh, and uh, I look forward to I look forward to also seeing you about twice a month. So. Keep a lookout uh, for our webinar invites uh, on data quality around uh, the themes of nutrition for the month of May. And uh, thanks again for your interest and active participation. Uh, this was a great session. Thanks very much. Thanks all. Bye bye.